If you had wondered, yes, it is warm on stage when those things fire. <laughs> it's great to be, as I said, back in Bulgaria for a third time for Webbit. And when Plowman asked me to present again this year, I thought, at Webbit, we hear from a lot of visionaries. We hear from people who've already succeeded and created their vision. We hear from people who are in the midst of attempting. And here in the room, some of you are visionaries or aspire to be so. So I thought, what does this mean? Where does it come from? What can we learn? So a few thoughts, by no means exhaustive. A visionary is someone who sees things in different ways and, I would add, also acts to attempt to make them happen. This could be in the real world, quote-unquote, as in building a company like Schalkut's company, U+. Or it could also be the world of fiction. Visionaries who create great fiction or great art uh, are acting in the world to create something of value for us. So what is this notion of a visionary? Well, I'd like to point out that we cannot fully understand our present unless we consider the future. Now, you might be thinking, no, I think he means the past. Well, this is true. We must consider the past. But I also believe we need to consider the future because that helps us understand the present. We can become more strategically opportunistic. What I mean by this is when things randomly it appears arise in your path, when you see new things or have opportunities, it's difficult to know whether to say yes or no if you haven't considered the world you want to build. As many people say, if, all, if you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. So having some way to envision not only the future that might occur, but the future you want to create has something to do with being a visionary. And what is this visionary thing? Well, I like to start with, uh, I like to start with paradigms and then action. And we'll examine a couple in the next few minutes. And I'll point out that just because someone doesn't succeed doesn't mean they weren't a visionary. And there are many definitions of success. So this is one of my favorite visionaries in history. All of the computer scientists in the world undoubtedly know this fellow, Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage is the godfather of the modern computer revolution. He was around in the mid-19th century, and in the early mid-19th century, he had a vision for a mechanical device called the difference engine. He had a vision later for another one called the analytical engine. And these were physical, mechanical forerunners of today's modern digital computers. At the time, of course, we didn't have digital capabilities. We hadn't even understood energy yet well enough to do so. But he had a notion for a physical device. His physical device was so visionary, it was impossible to produce. So he went to the parliament of the United Kingdom, his home country, and said, give me some money. So they gave him 1,500 pounds. At the time, this was a king's ransom. He spent all of it and barely completed 5% of his vision. So he went back to parliament, got more money. He went back to parliament, got more money. He went back to parliament. They finally said, look, Chuck, no more money. This doesn't seem to be working. And so then he started to spend his own personal fortune, a not insubstantial fortune, on building these pieces of equipment, and they never succeeded. Throughout his entire life, he was never able to complete either of these pieces of equipment to prove that his vision would actually manifest in the world, to give you a sense of how much effort and money was expended on these efforts. He spent the equivalent of 62 brand new locomotives in the 19th century. A brand new locomotive was the supercomputer of that time. He spent the equivalent of 62 brand new supercomputers to, in the physical sense, accomplish nothing. But was he a visionary? Now, meanwhile, this young lady, Ada Lovelace, the daughter of Lord Byron, the squash-buckling British poet, of course, this could only happen in Victorian England, the daughter of Lord Byron, Ada Lovelace, meets Charles Babbage and falls madly in love. But not madly in love with Chuck, unfortunately for him, madly in love with his vision, with this notion of the computer. And she said, Charles, I think your hardware will need something to tell it how to operate, what we might call software. And Ada Lovelace became the first computer programmer in history. In fact, she invented what programmers today call the routine. Meanwhile, in the 20th century, this fellow, Alan Turing, credits Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace directly for inspiring him in his efforts and foundational efforts in modern computer science, as do many other leaders in the 20th century. 
Were Babbage and Lovelace successful? Absolutely not, and absolutely so. Now, on the other hand, today we have some visionaries. This is just one of them, Jeff Bezos. You're all familiar with him. Has he created something profound in the world? Yes, many things. Has he also failed miserably? Yes, many times. That's part of his brilliance. He's able to envision many things and create a portfolio of options on the future. When faced with uncertainty, the answer is a portfolio of options. And so there are numerous opportunities he has pursued that have failed. But he knows that if your vision is big enough and your action is strong enough, eventually something will work. And he, by the way, is planning to move to Mars before the end of his life. Now, what is this? This is, yes, you guessed it, the world upside down. But is it really? You know that this map is equally as accurate as any map we've ever seen. It just appears wrong. What I want you to do when you look at this map is not think about this map. I want you to feel about this map. I want you to recognize that at the first moment you saw this map, you felt wrong. This is what I call an orthodoxy. A belief about the world that people believe it must be like that, even though it doesn't violate the laws of physics to try something else. A belief about the world that people believe must be like that, even though it doesn't violate the laws of physics to try something else. These are all around us all the time. And it is these orthodoxies, these paradigms, that enable us in the world, enable us to achieve and to survive, but that also limit us. The same paradigms that enable us limit us, and it is the visionaries that see around them. A couple months ago, I was speaking to a large bond rating agency in the United States. So banks and, and companies will hire them to rate a debt offering, for instance, and then that allows them to set a price and a rate. And they said, Professor, we have certain offerings for our customers that take one to two months. And we think that's too long, so we have put together a team to take that from one month to two weeks. And I said, that is very impressive. But what happens if someone introduces a solution that works in two minutes? You have now wasted an entire six months of effort, a great Herculean effort to go from one month to two weeks when someone else introduces an artificial intelligence solution that does the same work in two minutes. What is going on here is that they were stuck within the current paradigm. They understood the process better than anyone else. They knew exactly how everything fit together. And so their objective started from the paradigm, as opposed to starting from a brand new paradigm. This is an oil well. A lot of you have heard about fracking, hydraulic fracturing. Now, think what you want about this from an environmental perspective. That's a different discussion. It's an important discussion. But I'm just going to tell you what happened. Thirteen years ago, my consulting firm, Clario, was doing a future visioning program for a large global energy company. Thirteen years ago, fracking was already happening. In fact, it's been around for 40 years. It just never worked very well. And 13 years ago, there was an old crazy guy in Texas throwing stuff down a well to see what would happen, and it started working better. Now, what we did not say to our client was, oh, my gosh, you better get out of that traditional business and get into fracking. We had no idea if, if this was going to work. But what we did say is you need to pay attention. Additionally, 13 years ago, we tried to find an expert in the global oil and gas industry that believed that fracking would amount to anything significant at all. And we couldn't. We couldn't find a single expert anywhere on the planet that believed that fracking would be a significant factor. And in fact, in the last 10 years, it has changed the global geopolitical picture, not just the oil and gas industry. So what we cannot do when trying to create the future is rely on the existing experts. By the way, the experts are very important. Please keep them close. Please find them. Build relationships. Build relationships before you need them. But don't only rely on the traditional expert if you're trying to change the game because you're unlikely to get there. Now, you're all familiar with this lovely car. There's one right outside the pavilion. I have uh, an X, and I love it to death. Well, my wife has an X. I got rid of my car because I travel all the time, and I just use Uber. It's great, by the way. Back in 2010, Clario was working with Castrol, the lubricants company, and I won't go into the details about what we were doing, but I want you to note that 2010 was nine years ago. Anyone feeling old? I know I am. And at the time in 2010, everyone knew this company was going to fail. It was a foregone conclusion. Now, what is the main reason most people do not buy an electric vehicle? Well, it's called range anxiety. 
We even have a medical term for it, range anxiety, because people think they're going to be driving through the Mojave Desert and run out of charge and die a horrible death because there are no charging stations around. They say, Professor, I will be happy to buy an electric vehicle when there is infrastructure. This feels right, but it is completely wrong. How many of you have access to a garage? Anyone have access to a garage? Can you plug stuff in in your garage? Can you plug in your petrol-based car in your garage? Of course not. So the notion that we need hundreds of thousands of petrol stations all over the world in which I can plug in my car is a red herring. Right now there are dozens of investors investing in charging station infrastructure companies and they will all lose their money. Now, investing in charging capabilities, that's a great opportunity. The last speaker shared with you a brand new paradigm to help enable drones worldwide. But it is not simply a series of charging stations that mimic our traditional petrol stations. Why do we do this? We take the new thing and we cram it into the old paradigm over and over again. The first television show was a radio show on TV. Literally, people reading off scripts and there was a sound effects guy off to the side going, and you could see him in the frame. And then someone said, no, wait. We should record it and then edit it, and then put it on TV. Ladies and gentlemen, that took 15 years to figure out. We do not have 15 years to figure out obvious stuff. Visionaries explore the past, present, and the future. They envision the world they aspire to create. By the way, back in 2010, when we were doing that work for Castrol, included in that was the question of electric vehicles, which it's important to note. Electric vehicles take no engine oil, so you would think that a lubricants company would be paying attention to electric vehicles at the time, and the reality was no one was. But at that time, in China, all of these electric vehicles were built and sold. So the reality of the future was already out there on what I call the peripheries. It was out on the edges, not in the center of your market, but it's already out there. You just have to pay attention. You have to synthesize it, and you have to not let reality get in the way. Great visionaries start by understanding deeply what is needed. This fellow, Dr. Jeffrey Ling, a good friend of mine, spoke for Twin Global 2018 last year. He spent six tours of duty in the Middle East for the U.S. military as a doctor. He noted that often they would run out of drugs in the battle, on the battlefield, and it was unimaginable how he could run out of generic drugs when you needed them most. And so sometimes the solution would be for an Air Force pilot to put the drugs in his flight suit and get in an F-16 fighter jet from Germany and fly down to Afghanistan. That's a gas bill. What Dr. Ling said, we can make these products right here on site. So he built a 3D printer for pharmaceutical drugs, which is now, by the way, approved by the FDA for production of synthetic chemistry drugs. And they're right now working on the same piece of equipment, a similar piece of equipment to do biological drugs. Right here at this event is a representation of the notion of vision. Three, four, five years ago, would someone have said Sofia Bulgaria could be a digital capital? Very few. Well, there was one person, Plamen Rusev, and he said, this is possible and we need to make it happen. And all of you are making it happen. I'll conclude with two quotes from two of my favorite people, Ralph Waldo Emerson. There is no outside, no enclosing wall, no circumference to us. Men walk as prophecies of the next age. You are that prophecy, and it is the direction which you are walking that will define where we go. And finally, William James, the great American pragmatist and uh, progenitor of psychology, told us attention equals belief. He didn't say it affects belief. He said it equals belief. Because what he said was, what you believe affects what you pay attention to. What you pay attention to affects what you believe. What you believe pay, pay, affects what you find in the world and what you focus on. And thus, attention equals belief. And so my question to you is, to what do you attend? What will you create? Thank you very much.